All right, good evening, good evening. I'm going to get set up here as I'll be streaming from home here in Houston, Texas. Make sure that we have a good signal and everything is sounding well on your end. And I will crank it up here in a second. All right, welcome to another live stream broadcast. This is Brother Rashid, all the way from Houston, Texas, broadcasting on behalf of the ministry. Excited to share this message with you tonight. Thank you for joining in. By way of announcements, just want to encourage everyone to keep supporting this particular ministry, Omega Ministries, for the Dunamis Tabernacle, seeking to raise up a base camp to be a beacon of light starting out in Atlanta, Georgia and looking to raise up these tabernacles all across the United States to help rescue people as we see the end times approaching. So keep supporting the ministry as we keep pushing forward. Remember the conference is coming up in Atlanta May 22nd through the 25th. 2015 plenty of time to plan ahead to get all your ducks in a row to be at the conference definitely look forward to seeing your faces those that didn't make it to Destin Florida or even the previous conferences definitely want to see your face in the place in Atlanta next year so make time to plan and get everything in place for the conference in May those dates are May 22nd through the 25th and the prayer line will be still going on tonight. The Omega Ministries Prayer Conference that starts at 10 p.m. or 9 p.m. Eastern Standard. I'm, I'm in Texas, so you got to forgive me on the times. I'm in Central Standard Time Zone. So that's 9 p.m. or 8 p.m. my time, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that prayer line number is 805-399. 1000 805-399-1000 and the access code is 409-367 409-367 so as you can see I have a presentation here that we'll be going through tonight on the topic of evangelism 101 evangelism 101 if you've ever been in school you see after the title of your class you have a number that lets you know where you are if you're in college or mainly in college you see this number after whatever particular class you're in so it might be history 101 or 201 and what that means is you're coming in it's entry level and tonight we're gonna be dealing with the basics and the fundamentals of evangelism a really important topic especially for those Christians out there that are wanting to be an effective witness and represent Jesus Christ well. Everything we do for Jesus, we want to exceed and we want to succeed at representing Christ. We want to be ambassadors and we want to represent Christ well. So tonight we'll be discussing some facts around evangelism. We'll be looking at the focus, the heart of evangelism, as well as the fundamentals. So this is 101. Hopefully we can do 201 and 301 where we can delve into this topic a little more. And it's really centered around a training setting where you'll want to take notes and you'll really want to study this on your own time. Because I know if you're watching this message, you want to be equipped 
and you want to be trained to be an effective soldier in God's army. So evangelism 101. And like I said, hopefully we can get into to more topics. So tonight it's going to be kind of like if you've ever taken a summer school class, summer school is a condensed course for a few months over the summer. So you have this professor that basically have to they have to cram all this information into a few months and attempt to teach it to the students over the summer. So it's really what you call a crash course. It seems to go pretty fast, but you receive a lot of information at one time. And the cool thing about it is you get the same amount of credit for a summer school course that you would for a six-month course that you would spend all semester studying. So tonight is just going to be it's going to be just like that. It's going to be a crash course. So you'll want to keep pace with me as I'll be covering a lot of scriptures and we'll be talking through a lot of different questions that you may have centered around this topic of evangelism. So let's get into this message tonight. We'll pray and then we'll get started. Lord God in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to spend time in your word. We thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Teach us to do your will tonight, God. Deliver us from the world. Sanctify us from everything that's of the flesh, that we might be effective and useful for the kingdom of God. We present our members tonight as instruments of righteousness. Lord, we want to see your kingdom come. We want to see your will be done. So we sit at your feet tonight, Jesus, and ask that you would teach us Open the ears of our understanding. Open the eyes of our understanding. Give us a heart that's ready to receive and make us doers of your word, Lord. We know we must hear first. And once we've heard, Lord, help us to put these words into practice that we might see your kingdom manifested on earth as it is in heaven. Lord God, we trust you and we commit ourselves to your word. And we pray in Jesus' name, O oh God, that you remove all distractions and barriers from the enemy we are right now we bind the devil over this internet broadcast we disallow all distractions and disruptions and lord we ask that you send forth your angels to cover the homes and hearts of your people that we might hear receive and obey we want to be obedient father so we thank you for this opportunity lord we love you for it and we commit it to you in jesus name amen amen all right. Evangelism 101. Did you know that 95% of all Christians have never won a soul to Christ? 95% have never won a soul to Christ. Did you know that 80% of all Christians do not consi consistently witness for Jesus Christ? Less than 2% of Christians are involved in this ministry of evangelism. And 71% do not give towards the Great Commission. Jesus gave his disciples the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Go therefore into the world, making disciples of all men. Less than 2% less than of Christians are involved in this ministry. And 71% do not give towards this great ministry of evangelism. Tonight, we're going to examine why. We're going to look at some questions. Is it a matter of people not wanting to? Is it a matter of people not being confident and equipped to do these particular things <clears throat> as it relates to evangelism? Make sure we're getting some good sound here. So the world's solution to man's problem comes from a lot of different forms and different things that the world has sought to do to solve the problem of man. The world sees that there's an issue with mankind and they've tried to solve it. So they've tried to put in government programs, all type of nonprofit programs. You have these massive social work programs that study the mind of man and humanity is convinced that now the solution to man's problem is tolerance and acceptance 
if we just accept everybody, if we embrace everybody, whatever their culture and their walk of life is, that'll solve our problems. That'll bring peace on earth. And you and I both know that that's not the solution. What is the solution? Faith in God's word. I believe it's R.W. Schambach that said all you need is faith in God's word. You don't have any problems. All you need is faith in God's word. And that's what the devil is fighting. Faith in God's word is your confidence. That word faith is fidelity, faithfulness. Your confidence in the word of God and what the word of God says. You see in Hebrews 11, I call it the hall of faith, where you see different men like Abraham and Noah and David. And the scripture talks about what these men did by faith. And it was by faith that we see Noah building that ark. Saving his family because he believed God. And this is what the enemy is fighting. Tooth and nail, he's after your faith. If he can destroy and minimize your confidence in God's word, he is successful at his mission. That's the reason why you have a lot of false doctrines. that I, they, they put together what I call cafeteria Christianity. Where you can pick and choose the different parts of the scripture that you want. And you can leave the rest. Faith in God's word is the solution in God's economy. Our trust and our faith in what God has spoken. That's the remedy. That's the remedy tonight. So the goal of my message tonight is to hopefully train you and equip you to become a more effective and useful minister of the gospel. A faithful witness for Jesus Christ. That's the goal of this message. So you see on the screen, what is what is evangelism? What is it? Evangelism is a gift from God. The Greek word for evangelism is euangeliso. Euangeliso. And that word means to announce good news, to declare, to bring glad tidings, to preach the gospel. Preaching, declaration, a herald. If you've ever watched TV and heard that beeping sound come on your screen and all of a sudden at the bottom you see that ticker that comes at the bottom with a message, a public service announcement, a flash flood warning. You see that public service announcement that's being made to warn you or to inform you of something that's happening in your county or something that's going on around you. Evangelism is the announcement of good news, the declaration of God's kingdom. That's what evangelism is. This is a gift from God. Where I grew up at in Colleen, Texas, right outside of Austin and in that area, Fort Hood is the military base in Colleen. The name of the newspaper in Colleen, Texas is the Colleen Daily Herald. They're publishing news. They herald the news that's going on in that city. And in old times, in old ancient times, they would have a person that would come into the city speaking for the king as a herald. And he would come forth and roll out that scroll and he would say, Hear ye, hear ye, the words of the king. And that was how they communicated messages in those times. That was their means of communication. Now we have the news, the internet. And we have a lot of different mediums where we hear announcements, where we receive different messages. Evangelism is the announcement of good news. It's not just any news, but it's good news. And we know that good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what is the gospel? Let's look at Romans chapter 10 to kick it off. What is the gospel? And let's come to understand how we define what good news is. Look at Romans chapter 10. Starting at verse 14. And I'm reading from the New King James. Romans 10 14 says, How then shall they call on him and whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach? How shall they declare unless they are slim, unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach 
the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. How beautiful are the feet of the evangelist. How beautiful are the feet of those that are carrying the good news into people's lives. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. How can they hear without a preacher? And how can he preach except he be sent? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This chapter gives us a, a great overview of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And these various aspects of what makes the gospel exactly what it is. 1 Corinthians 15, and I'll read down from verse 1 to verse 19. The scripture reads, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached. Notice what Paul says. The gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast the words which I preach to you, unless you believed in, and believed in vain. So you see the if then, by which you are also saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach, preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Verse 3, for I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. This is the gospel that Paul received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once. Of whom the greater part remained to, be, remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all of the apostles. Then last of all he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they are. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. Verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do, some of, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. If Christ has not risen, nobody has risen from the dead. And what you and I believe, there's no point. Now you realize that the bur the death, the burial, and the pinnacle of the gospel is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul here is saying, if Christ has not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Verse 15, yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead did not rise. So here we are doing all this talking and all this laborious work and we're laboring and witnessing for the Lord that didn't even raise. What a shame if that's the truth. Look at verse 17. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. Your faith is vain. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only... We have hope in Christ. We are of all men most pitiable. We are of all men most miserable if our hope in Christ is only based in this life. The resurrection lifts us to a place of eternity. That's the pinnacle of the death, the burial, and the resurrection experience of Jesus Christ. I like verse 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So Paul goes on to challenge their questions and then he verifies and confirms Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Because if he hadn't risen, then I wouldn't have been risen. You know, Paul persecuted the church. He went and dragged people out of their house. Paul was a murderer. Paul was on his way to hell. He was in the accelerated program, the accelerated course to get to hell. 
the AP class, you know, those overachievers in school. Paul was the overachiever in the AP class, and he was going to get to hell on the fast track. And he said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Because Jesus didn't just die, according to the scriptures. He didn't just, he wasn't just buried. Jesus Christ, the son of almighty God, was risen from the dead. Therefore, I can be crucified with Christ and I can be risen to life again with him. This is the good news. It's not just any old message. Notice what it said. According to the scriptures, in the gospel of John, the scripture says, if you believe on me, Jesus speaking, as the scriptures have said, not some encyclopedia, not some piece of literature, as the scriptures have declared. Our faith is in this word. That's what makes the difference. So the gospel is the death of Jesus Christ, the burial of Jesus Christ, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you see that parallel in more than one way. You see the parallel of Exodus or coming out of Egypt, death to the flesh coming out of Egypt in, uh, in, in the book of Exodus. The children of Israel, they came out of Egypt, which is the world, dying to the world, going into the wilderness, which is that burial, having to be mortified and killed off from the thing that they participated in in Egypt, and then going into Canaan land, the promised land, the resurrection, the resurrected life, the life of promise, the life that flows with milk and honey, the life that it talks about in Psalm chapter 1 where the tree, the leaf doesn't wither and you bear fruit in your season because you're planted by the rivers of water. The life that's fruitful, the life that's reflective of what God told Adam before he fell, be fruitful and multiply. That's the, resurrec that's the resurrected life that the Lord is looking to magnify and manifest in each and every believer. The resurrected life. And Paul says, if it didn't happen, I'm wasting my time talking to you right now on live stream. You wasting your time listening to me. And Paul was wasting his time writing to the Corinthians. But Jesus Christ did rise. I was telling a co-worker of mine the other day how there are people who are not even Christians. People who didn't even believe in God. That wrote an account of the life of Christ. Historical facts that show Jesus Christ walked this earth. That show that these letters that I'm reading from the scriptures are all valid. This is historical. This is not even by revelation. This is nothing more than historical data that can be traced back through time. Nebuchadnezzar and the various kingdoms and Medo-Persia and the things that we read about in the scripture are all historical facts. What you and I believe as it relates to the gospel, as it relates to the scriptures, it's all facts. So my faith, my confidence is not placed in some myth. Jesus Christ isn't a mythical figure. Jesus Christ was a real man that, rocked, that walked the same planet that you and I lived on. Jesus Christ was buried behind a tomb. And when they went to that tomb, the tomb had been rolled away. This really happened. That's what the devil is fighting. The devil is fighting the faith and us believing the truth of the resurrection of Christ. He's not so much concerned with the death or the burial. He's fighting the resurrection because without the resurrection, our faith is in vain. We're still in our sins. This is the good news that we proclaim. This is what is the very fundamental of evangelism is about. You have to proclaim the right message because without the right message, you lead people to the wrong thing. And we're not trying to lead anybody astray. That's for sure. So evangelism is a gift. Evangelism is a gift from Almighty God. <clears throat> so we're moving on. And we see that's the good news. But in order to understand the good news, we must first understand the bad news. That's where the good news is really, truly apprehended and understood 
when you understand what the bad news is. Look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And I'm going to flip from Romans 3, and we'll flip through Romans 3, 4, and we'll go through a few of these chapters to examine the bad news to get a real understanding of the very fundamentals of the message and why and how the message must be consistent with what the word of God says. So we see good news is that Jesus Christ has indeed risen from the dead. And this is why the gospel is good news. Working with this computer here, just give me a second. Before you can preach the good news, it starts with bad news. Look at Romans chapter 3. You know some of these passages. It says in Romans 3, verse 9, Romans 3, verse 9, What then? Are we better than they? Not all, for we, not at all, for we have previously charged both Jews and Greek, Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Everybody, everybody has turned aside. There is none who does good. Look down at verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the bad news that makes good news good starts with the law. We see the law proclaimed by Moses in Exodus chapter 20. The law of Moses, where we read in John chapter 1, Jesus said, Moses brought the law. Jesus Christ brought grace and truth. So you see, the, you see grace and truth which is good news, contrasted by the law, which is the bad news. Before you can really get into the gospel of Jesus Christ, you got to take people all the way back to how we even got to the place of needing salvation. What's the real issue with humanity? We know that Adam and Eve fell in the garden. We know that sin entered by one man. That disobedient act that Adam did Caused the world to fall away through one man's sin, we all are condemned. But through one man's righteous act, Jesus Christ, we all have the opportunity to be redeemed. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What's the glory of God? The glory of God is what Jesus Christ achieved through moral perfection. Moral perfection is what Jesus Christ achieved. Jesus was perfect. He didn't sin not once, which made him able to be the scapegoat for you and I, which made him able to stand in the place for you and I. Jesus Christ was morally perfect because he kept every one of the commandments. That's what made Jesus Christ perfect. So when you're dealing with people and you're seeking to minister to a person, this is the, this is the, the, the litmus test, if you will. And you want to note this. You give the law to those that are proud. And you give grace to those that are humble. You give the law to those that are proud. And you give grace to those that are humble. The Bible talks about in James how God resists the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. Again. Law to the proud, grace to the humble. The law is the bad news. This is the reason why the Pharisees and Sadducees had such a big issue with Jesus. Because Jesus was coming to fulfill the law that they were trying to keep. And we just read in Romans, all have sinned, Jews and Gentiles alike. 
all have fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus Christ kept the righteous standard. He obeyed the commandments of God. He honored his mother and father. He didn't steal. He didn't murder. Exodus 20 gives you the commandments. Memorize the Ten Commandments because when you're given the law and you're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, the law is the standard that brings the whole world guilty. A proud person, I don't care how much money they have, I don't care who they are. When you present the law, the law brings everybody under the judgment of God. This is the bad news, is that we're all condemned under the law. We can't, we can't be accepted in God's sight by the works of the law. And when you're born as a little baby, your mind operates by the law. Because the Bible talks about your conscience. Your conscience literally means, it's a, it's a two-part word. It's the word con, which means with conscience. It means with knowledge. The word conscience means with knowledge. So when you sin, you sin with the knowledge that is sin. God put the conscience inside of a man to show him his own sinfulness. <clears throat> and we read in Matthew chapter 19, a classic, a classic example of what law to the proud and grace to the humble looks like. Jesus encountered the rich young ruler. It's in Matthew 19. You don't have to turn there. Jesus encountered the rich young ruler. He said, Master, he came to Jesus esteeming him. He said, Good master. And Jesus said, Why do you call me good? There is none good but God. And the rich young ruler went on to ask Jesus, What must he do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, Keep the commandments. He was referring to the commandments, to the law of Moses. He told him to keep the commandments. Now, get this. Let's, let's, let's turn there. Let's look at this together. Matthew 19. Just a few verses. And we'll look at a, cl a classic example of this standard through which you minister and you are seeking to, to communicate with people. Law to the proud, grace to the humble. Matthew 19, verse 16. Jesus said, the scripture says, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit or that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's six of the ten main commandments right there. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus exposed the pride and the idolatry in the rich young ruler's heart by the law. He preached the law. The first two commandments deal with your relationship with God. No other gods before the Lord God Almighty. No other God. If you want to know and study the commandments, Study Exodus chapter 20 for the sole purpose of understanding why the good news is good. Because everybody's condemned under the bad news. Everybody has fallen short of God's righteous standard, which is moral perfection. The commandments, the keeping of the commandments. That's why in the book of James, he says, if you broke one, you broke all the commandments. So you can't be justified by the works of the law. And here we see the proud, rich young ruler thought he had a way in until the master teacher, Jesus Christ, exposed his heart. His sin was idolatry. He had great possessions. He cared more about his money than he did the true and living God. And the commandments, I believe it's the second commandment, it says you shall have, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Don't make a, don't make anything 
anything that's tangible into an idol. I am a jealous God. Read it in Exodus 20. Exodus 20. You shall not take the name of the Lord the Lord God in vain. How, how many people use the Lord's name carelessly? Oh, oh my God. People, that, when people say OMG, do you realize that they're, they're saying, oh my God, as if God is just Joe the mechanic down the street. They've taken a name that's so holy, a name that's so high and lifted up, and they're bringing it down and making it nothing. Don't do that. Don't use the Lord's name lightly. Because in Exodus 20, God has taken account of those that will be judged by the law, those that are not in Christ. John chapter 1, Moses brought the law, Jesus Christ brought grace and truth. The good news, grace and truth. I can live in that resurrected life with Jesus Christ if I go through the death, the burial, to be raised with Jesus. What is death? I got to repent of me. I got to die to me. I got to go and I got to deny myself, take up my cross and follow Jesus up to Calvary. I got to go in that. I have to go behind that tomb and be buried. See, it's not me believing in that Jesus did that. I'm believing in Jesus, the, the fact that he did it. But my belief, my faith is exemplified in the fact that I follow him to the cross. I follow him to the grave. That's what water baptism is about. Water baptism is a symbolism of a grave. It's a watery grave. And in Exodus, when the children of Israel had escaped from, from Pharaoh and his army, the Bible says the, the symbolic picture of when they walked on dry ground on the other side of the Red Sea, their enemies were drowned. And the, it says they were baptized under Moses. That, that water that the enemy, that Pharaoh's army were drowned in was the children of Israel's baptism under Moses. See, Moses, before the Red Sea experience, he was a leader and they were listening to him, but they weren't yet really yoked to Moses. They were still having some issues with following what he was really saying. But when that red, when he lifted up that staff and he parted that Red Sea and they walked over on dry ground and they looked behind them seeing the enemy coming to see that water engulf the enemy, they were baptized, the scripture says, unto Moses. So baptism is a death. Their enemies were drowned in the in the flood, in the in the Red Sea. And they went on to attempt to possess the land, and we know that they didn't. But we see here the rich young ruler had the law preached to him, exposed his prideful heart. He went away because he was an idolater. That's the litmus test. And see, good news is bad news to good people. The person with the money, the person who's giving a charity, the person who looks at somebody who, who is stealing or they look at someone that's doing something bad and they kind of look at them, they look down on them. They look with a condescending look upon them. The, the gospel is bad news to them because the gospel says your good deeds won't get you in. You're trying to keep the law. You're trying to, to, to work the law and do all these righteous things to be pleasing to God. You won't get in. All these false religions, everything from Jehovah, Jehovah's Witnesses down to Mormonism, these are, cult, these are false cult religions or cult religions that are seeking to work their way to be pleasing to God. Paul said, I ain't just repenting of the bad things that I did. I'm repenting of the good things that I did as well. And when you come to Jesus, there's things that you got to lay down that you felt like was a good thing. And the reason why it's not good, this is the reason why. Because it doesn't meet God's moral standard of righteousness. Moral perfection. Which is why we have to come to Jesus Christ. We have to be found in the one who was morally perfect. We have to be found in the one who was without sin. This is the core message of the gospel. If you preach the wrong gospel, you'll lead people to the wrong thing. We see it in, in 2 Corinthians 11. Another gospel. People receiving another gospel. And most people's gospel that they preach is an accursed thing. Because it leaves out repentance. It leaves out the need for you and me to die to what we are. 
to lay down our lives that Christ might take it up again. There's no resurrection until there's a body up there on that cross. That's what the sufferings and the tribulations that you and I suffer. That's why people are going through. To be brought to their knees. That they might lift their hands up to an almighty God. I heard a saying that you stand tallest when you're on your knees. And that ain't scripture, but I see the, the, the truth of that. In 2 Corinthians, you can make a note of this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul talks about how the law is what's called the ministry of death. He talked about in 2 Corinthians 3, and I'm not going to turn there. He talked about how there was glory that came from the law because when Moses went up to speak with God, his, his face was so lit up from being in the presence of God that he had to cover his face with the veil. So the law was a glorious thing. And in 2 Corinthians 3, it says, if the law had glory, if the, if the ministry that ministered death to you and me, because we can't be righteous in God's sight by the law, there's nothing we can do. If that ministry had glory, how much more the glory of the Spirit? How much more the ministry that leads you and I to Jesus Christ, the ministry of grace and truth, the ministry of salvation? How much more glorious? Now think about that. Something that would kill you had glory, the law. All the law does is show you your sinfulness. That's what the law does. Let's look at let's look at a little bit more at this because this is so critical to preaching the gospel truth and bringing people to their senses. Like we see, we see the the prodigal son. He came to himself. He came to himself, and this is so necessary to communicate with people when you're trying to share the gospel. Look at Romans. Look back over at Romans. And I'll bounce around a couple of scriptures. Romans chapter 4, verse 15 says, Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. If, if God never gave the law, he could have never judged, he could have never judged the rich young ruler according to the law. There's no rule, I'm not a rule breaker. But the law shows us transgression. Romans 5 verse 13 says for until the law was in the world for until the law sin was in the world Romans 5 13 but sin is not imputed where there is no law God cannot charge sin to your account if there is no law that says what you're doing is wrong that police officer cannot pull you over he cannot give you a ticket if there's not a law against running that stop sign or running that red light or speeding or driving without a seatbelt if there's no law against it, they can't credit that to you. But the law brings everybody into a place of sinfulness. Look at Romans 7. And I'm bouncing around to show you because before you can get to the good news, you got to know the bad news. People have to be lost before they can be found. Look at Romans 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, listen to Paul. I would not have known sin except through the law. So how do we re reveal people's sin to them? You preach the law. David Wilkerson said they built Times Square Church by preaching the law to those actresses and all those folks from Broadway coming into Times Square Church. He said they preached the law until people begin to see themselves as, as absolutely helpless without the grace of Jesus Christ. You got to preach the bad news before you can tell people and before people can really understand why grace is so amazing. This is the dilemma that the world is in. People have minimized and they're blowing the gospel off as some major minor thing because they don't understand the penalty that comes with trying to do the works of the law. There's a penalty. There's condemnation. There's condemnation appended to somebody that's trying to do the law, that's trying to do all the, the righteous deed. There's no trying in the gospel. There's only dying. That's all that exists. And that's why I'm harping on this, because this is one of the most important parts to have a message that will really bring people to repentance. 
couple of more scriptures. Verse 8 in Romans chapter 7. But sin, taking the opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desires. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, I was, look, look what he says. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, <laughs> I found to bring death. For sin, taking an occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy. The law is good. The commandment is holy and just and good. But it's in me. The issue is with me. The sin is with me. Which is the reason repentance is the first step to enter in the kingdom of God. Repentance. You must repent and believe the gospel. Jesus preached repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When John the Baptist started his ministry, the first words out of his mouth were repent. Paul, Peter, they all preached the same message. And you're repenting from the fact that you've been trying to please God from a sinful state, not realizing that you can't please God in sin. You can't educate Adam. You can't dress Adam up. I heard a message from Derek Prince the other day. He said, God's solution, God's solution is execution. I love that. You must execute that old man that will try to do the right thing. And you hear people all the time. Are you a Christian? Are you born again? Well, you know, I go to church and they'll, what they'll do is just what the rich young ruler started to do. They'll start telling you the good things that they do, not realizing that anything good that you have done will not help you. There are no good people in heaven. The only people that make it to heaven are those that are obedient and overcome. Because nothing good that we do can be brought before God as anything righteous. This is the gospel. This is what breaks man down and brings him to himself. And you get you get one or two people. You'll get the rich young ruler that'll walk away because he's pride and he loves his idol and he's bound by the devil. Or you'll get Zacchaeus climbing up in the tree. He was a tax collector. He heard Jesus was coming. He was a short man. He climbed up in the tree and he was humble. Jesus looked at Zacchaeus. He said, come down out of that tree. I'm having dinner at your house tonight. Now, this was a man who saw his sin. Jesus got to his house. He said, Lord, I'll, I'll give the money back. I'll give him whatever I need. He was ready to repent. He was ready to change. Law to the proud, grace to the humble. All right, let's move on. Let's move on. Look at this quote. God sends no one away empty except those who are full of themselves. You come to Jesus Christ, he won't cast you out. He won't turn you away. But if you're full of yourself, just like the rich young ruler was, I guarantee you, you're going to turn around. You got to come. You have to come empty, ready to die to everything that you are, that Jesus Christ might take you up and put in you the new life of Christ. Bad news must precede the good news. Now, if you got the woman caught in the act of adultery, you don't see Jesus preaching the law and going through the commandments with her. She was humble. She was broken. What did he offer her? He offered her grace. Those are the two categories of people that, you're, that you'll encounter as you're seeking to minister the word of God. Those that are proud, preach the law. Show them by the commandments. Man, you're not righteous. Man, you're not holy. You knew that when you lied, you were lying. You knew that when you stole that, you were stealing that because your conscience bore witness to the truth that you were doing it. But you did it anyway. Repent before the living God and God will offer you grace. Versus the person that they already see. Man, I took that. I was wrong. Their conscience is convicting them. Their conscience is bearing witness to the truth of what they're doing. This is all designed by God. And when you preach the law... The Bible says it makes sin exceedingly sinful. So before I heard the commandments, before I was told not to covet, before the commandment that says thou shalt not covet, I knew that it was wrong in my heart because my conscience told me. But when the commandment comes and I hear the commandment, it's just like a two-year-old kid that you tell them, don't touch that. All of a sudden now, the sin is revived. That sin, that Ad Adamic nature raises up in them. I'm going to touch it. 
And if I'm not touching it with my hands, I'm touching it in my mind. That rebellious nature. That's what Jesus Christ crucified. That's why the good news is so powerful. He killed the nature and he raised to life, taking the power over that nature. He took, he took the power of death. The scripture says, where's the sting of death? Jesus Christ took it. He took the power of sin. Now we can receive the power of the Holy Ghost. The bad news must precede the good news. So what's the purpose of evangelism? What is the purpose? Here we see a picture of the Titanic sinking. And we see these lifeboats of people. When I did the research, I began to really understand why evangelism is, why this ministry is so critical and why the devil is fighting this ministry tooth and nail. This is the ministry that rescues the perishing. The whole point and purpose of evangelism is to rescue sinners from the coming judgment. God is going to judge this world. According to Romans 1, his wrath will boil over. And evangelism send forth messengers with good news to declare Jesus Christ died. He was, he was buried. He took death for you. He took the burial for you and he rose for you that you might live again. And as this ship is going down, as the culture is eroding away, that lifeboat that's on those ships, every cruise ship has lifeboats on them. And it's usually they usually have anywhere from 18 to 20 lifeboats. And on those lifeboats, you can fit about 16 to 20 people. But the issue is that people get in the lifeboat they get to safety, but they don't go back to rescue others. Selfishness. Selfishness. And I shared those statistics earlier, not to be, not to discourage you or to bring any type of judgment upon you, but to show you why this ministry is so critical to learn and to be equipped and to have the fundamentals and the understanding to be effective at it. Because you want to reach people for Christ. You want to tell them the right thing. And sometimes we just don't know. That's what the whole purpose of this is, to rescue sinners from the coming judgment. Malachi 4, to turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers. And to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. It's turning the world right side up. You see in the whole book of Acts, that's what the message was. Was come back to God, be restored, be reconciled again. And these lifeboats are necessary to get the people off of the Titanic onto the shore get them to Christ, get them to safety, rescue from the, ju the judgment that's coming, and to take the lifeboat back into the world and to get as many as you can off of that ship. Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I've been anointed to preach the gospel to the poor, to give recovery of sight to the blind, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The Bible says in Luke 4, Jesus came to proclaim freedom. You can be free from your good works and your bad works to do the work of the Lord. It's a rescue mission. It's a recycling, taking those crushed up cans. You see an old man in the hood carrying that bag full of cans. Well, those cans, those cans, the life that siphoned out of those cans because somebody took it and drunk the liquid out of it and crushed it up. That's those cans are that's not it for those cans. It's not over. Those cans are on their way to being recycled. That's what evangelism is about. It's about recycling the lives of men and women and making them useful to God again. That's the light. That's our testimony. I was lost. Now I'm found. Now I can serve God. Now I can be useful to God. I was talking with my wife the other day about how we should view people. Notice how Jesus interacted with the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. He never made her feel like a prostitute. He never made her feel like a whore. But he told her the truth. Be careful to make, be careful and, and discern your own heart as it relates to that judgmental heart. You can look condescending without ever saying anything to people. You can say something a certain way and people will receive judgment from you. God has placed an extreme value on human beings. 
Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. While we were in sin, Christ died for us. God has placed an extreme value on human beings. God still believes that people can come to him and be restored to him. We should believe the same thing. We don't get in the lifeboat and just take our salvation and run with it. We get in the lifeboat, we get secure in it, and we go back to minister to the lives of other people. To turn their hearts back to God. We want to be a part of the rescue mission. God's, God's purpose is that no man would perish. God has a wish. He says, I wish that nobody would perish, but that all would come and repent. All that, that no man would perish, but all would come to repentance. That's God's desire. So when you're dealing with people, whether they're homosexuals, whether they're lesbians, no matter what they are, see them with God's desire in mind. See them as able to get on that lifeboat and able, be, and able to be rescued from God's judgment. That's necessary to really operate in the ministry of evangelism. Why did God choose? Why did God choose this form of communication? Why evangelism? Why, why the foolishness of preaching? I mean, you're telling me God's eternal purpose can be understood through somebody proclaiming and being a herald and sharing the message of Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I got to speed up a little bit here, so stay with me. 1 Corinthians 1. Why did God choose the foolishness of preaching? What's the big deal? He, he could have chose a lot of other methods to reach mankind. And we see in 1 Corinthians 1 the answer to this question. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men you know why God chose the foolishness of preaching what why he chose the proclamation of the truth he chose this form this method to reach man to exclude those that are proud and to receive those that are humble see the educated person thinks somebody standing up on a soapbox in a marketplace and preaching is foolishness. I heard a message from Art Katz. Art Katz is a Messianic Jew. Art Katz talked about when he preached the gospel in a setting, there were Jews there. And he could literally see the sneering and the snarling in their faces because they could not believe this man was preaching Jesus Christ to someone who was entrusted with the law, to someone who, you know, whose father was Abraham. He said these men sneered at him. The foolishness of preaching is to exclude those that are proud and to give grace to the humble. That, that's, that message right there, that quote that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble, that will explain why God chooses to do what he does. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is, you know, the, the scripture goes on in 1 Corinthians 1. Not many wise are called, not many noble. Is it that the nobleman can't be saved? Absolutely not. Is it that the nobleman is most likely proud? Absolutely yes. Is it that the man with money feels he has no need for God? He's trusting in his riches. He doesn't realize that his money can make itself wings and fly away. That's why God chose evangelism. That's why God chose the foolishness of preaching. To shame those that are wise. He takes the foolish things to shame those that are wise, the things that are weak, to shame those that those people that are strong, those great orators who can speak and they say everything right and eloquence. Demonstrate the kingdom of God. Preach the gospel and those words are confirmed with signs following. This is God's method. And you should become, you should, you should pay attention to your speech, how you talk. If your speech is clear and learning how to communicate, not in a way where you become you become narcissistic and so into yourself, 
but you want to use your voice. Your voice is just like a violin. Your voice is just like a, 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 a piano. Your voice is an instrument that God wants to speak through. The foolishness of proclamation to shame those people that are foolish. That's why God chose the ministry of evangelism. That's why he chose this form of communication. And I won't read it all, but in Acts chapter 17, Paul is in Athens. He's in a place where there's a lot of philosophers and, you know, there's a lot of wise people. The university is there. and There's a bunch of brilliant people in this city. And God used Paul in an intellectual environment by standing up and proclaiming that this statue, this idol, the Bible says in Acts 17, Paul saw that they were very religious. As he walked through the city and he looked at what this city was bound by, he saw all the different idols that they worshipped. And he saw an idol that said, to an unknown God. And Paul said, this unknown God, he took a, he took a trampoline put it on top of that idol and he would he 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 would use that idol as a springboard to expose them to Jesus Christ that's the brilliance and intelligence and that God gave Paul in Acts 17 when he was in Athens these men came together in a room just to hear something new just to talk about what's the latest new thing and Paul you God used Paul to bring the truth of the gospel to these men through preaching. He stood up on Mars Hill and he proclaimed the truth. He says, in him, in God, you, you live, move, and have your being. And what's amazing when you study that, put that in your notes, what's amazing when you study that in Acts 17, you see that at the end of that discourse, there were people who were able to hear Paul. They were able to hear him and they became his followers because he had the courage and boldness to stand up and proclaim Jesus Christ in that setting. Now this is really, really important. Who's who in evangelism? We have to make a clear distinction between the ministry gift that we see in Ephesians 4. The scripture says, And he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So here we see the five-fold ministry gifts. We see... Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The specific gifts, notice, some called. Not all called, but some are called to participate in these particular functions of the body of Christ. And we have to make these distinctions as to who's who in evangelism. Because you might be saying, well, I'm not an evangelist. You know, I ain't. God hasn't put a calling on me to go forth in the marketplace and herald the gospel of Jesus Christ. But let's look at this. Turn with me to 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4. And I told you this is a summer school course. It's a crash course. You got to have your pen handy and we're, we're rolling. We're rolling and moving through the scriptures <clears throat> in this, this particular teaching. 2 Timothy chapter 4. The scripture says... Paul writing to Timothy, preach the word, verse 2, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves, and they will turn their ears away from the truth, and be turned aside to fables, but you, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, do the work of an evangelist. Timothy was not an evangelist. Timothy was what you call an apostolic delegate. What is that? What's an apostolic delegate? An apostolic delegate is a person who has been delegated authority from an apostle, being Paul, to do a specific work wherever he is at the time being. An apostolic delegate. The disciples that were called to be apostles were apostolic delegates. You see Jesus delegating his apostolic authority and giving them the power that he had and sending them forth to various cities to do what he did. 
They went evangelizing because they had been delegated the authority to do the work of an evangelist. So there's two types of people. There's those that are called. We see that in Ephesians 4. There's, they operate in the specific ministry gift of an evangelist. And we'll look at that here in a second in Acts chapter 8. And then there are the generic body of Christ, every born again believer, able to represent Jesus Christ wherever they go. Now look at this. Look at Acts chapter 8. Paul tells Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Look at Acts chapter 8. Two people. Those that do the work of an evangelist. Those that are called to be an evangelist. Acts chapter 8 verse 4. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Those that are doing the work. They're preaching everywhere they go. Then we see the calling of an evangelist right here in verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Philip demonstrated miracles. Philip brought great joy to Samaria. Philip had to deal with Simon the sorcerer. Philip was translated after he ministered to the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip was called to be an evangelist. Acts chapter 21, Philip the evangelist, who had four daughters that did prophesy. Everybody is not called to be an evangelist. Everybody's not called to be an apostle. Everybody's not called to be a pastor. But everybody in the body of Christ is called to do the work of an evangelist. Every single born again believer. Look at verse 4. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere. There was not one place that they didn't proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. They declared the word of the Lord everywhere they went. And then you see called off in verse 5 that ministry gift, that fivefold gifting operating in Philip. And I won't read it, but Philip did miracles. Philip was a mighty man of God. Now check this out. In, in the previous chapter, in Acts chapter 7, that's when Stephen was stoned. In Acts chapter 6, there were people complaining that they weren't being served. The apostle said, choose seven men full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. The first person they chose was Stephen. The second person they chose was Philip. Stephen got stoned. Philip was the next man in line. It's a military affair. One man drops, next person in line. And you see Philip do a mighty work for the kingdom of God. Why? Because he was called to it. And you see the persecution coming in Acts chapter 8. You had Philip doing his work. You had all the other believers doing the exact same thing. The results will be different. The fruit will be different. But the work is all the same. God places different people in different callings because he knows that person. He used Paul in Athens because Paul was very intellectual. Paul knew how to talk to the philosophers and bring them to themselves. He used Peter with the, with the Jews. Peter was very confrontational. He uses different people based on your temperament, based on your personality. John wasn't like Paul. You remember in the, in the end of the Gospels, Peter was asking about John. He asked Jesus about John. Jesus said, what does John have to do with you? Do what I tell you to do, Peter. Don't be concerned with John. If I'm asking you to feed my sheep, you be a shepherd to my sheep. Don't be concerned with what everybody else is doing. You do the work of an evangelist. You proclaim the good news to the lost. You go on a rescue mission. It's personal, but it's collective in the sense that everybody else should be doing the same thing. That's critical. That's critical. Apostles, apostles govern. Evangelists go and gather people. Teachers garner. You know, they, they're, they're, they're shepherding. Hold on one second. Let me get this back up. All right. So teachers are shepherding and the prophets are, are seers. They're foretelling what's coming. They're warning the people of God. Everybody is called to be an evangelist, to do the work and gather people. Why? Because that Titanic ship is going down. The people are drowning in their sin. 
the world is preparing for the judgment of God. And you and I are called as effective witnesses and ministers of the gospel to get them off of that boat. To rescue the perishing. To rescue the perishing. So are you an evangelist? Yes. You do the work of an evangelist. If you're called to be an evangelist as a five-fold ministry gift, there's no question. You'll know it. Because when God calls somebody, he makes it very clear what he calls you to do. Very clear. He'll send an angel. He'll send it in a dream. He'll make it very clear to you what he's calling you to do. So you'll know. Now, what type of evangelist are you? What type? Let's look at six different types of evangelists. Number one, you have the confrontational evangelist. This is like Peter. Jesus was confrontational in Matthew 16, 15. He said, who do you say that I am? He asked very direct questions and he wanted a very direct answer. That's somebody that's willing to confront. They're willing to stand up and speak the truth and not go around. They drive the truck straight through the city. You confront people's fears and questions and objections. The confrontational evangelist. What about the intellectual evangelist? That's where we see Paul in Acts chapter 17. He was dealing with philosophers. He was dealing with Plato and Socrates in Athens. He had to appeal to their intellect. Paul said, I become all things to all men. Why? That I might by all means win some of them. I want to win some of them. So I'm willing to become what they are. You're, you're, you're an intellectual. I'll become an intellectual to win you to Christ. It's for a purpose that I'm humbling myself and catering to what you are. I don't compromise my stance for the gospel. I don't compromise. I don't compromise and sin to become what you are. But I'm willing to I'm willing to put on the headscarf as a woman to reach that woman that's bound by the law. To show her, you know what? Christ is the your husband is your head and Christ is the head of that is the head of your man. The intellectual evangelist that example is found in Acts 17. The testimonial evangelist, John chapter 9, a man born blind. Jesus opened his eyes. He testified. He told the, when, he, when they stood him in the council, he told them, he said, I was born blind, now I see. And he testified. The woman at the well was a testimonial evangelist. She told the good news. She went back to her hometown and she said, come and meet a man who told me everything about myself. And they went back and they met Jesus and they came back to her and they said, we don't believe you because of what you said about him. We believe him because we met him. She led people to Christ, but because of her testimony. Keep your testimony fresh. Be ready to tell your testimony at any given minute because people need to hear what you were and what you're becoming. That's extremely critical. People want to know how you came to God. These are people who... They, they have that tendency to always tell their testimony. But when you're telling your testimony, preach the gospel. Talk about how you died to sin. Talk about your baptism. Talk about the burial and how you had to be buried with Christ to be raised to new life with him. Talk about how you received the Holy Ghost. Talk about how you spoke in other tongues. Don't be ashamed to tell your testimony. The Bible says, I am unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. They excommunicated the man in John chapter 9. Because he, was, he stood bold. They tried to bring his parents in and ask his parents. His parents said, look, he's a grown man. Talk to him. They brought him back in. He said, what I told you before, I'm repeating the same thing again. I was born blind and now I can see. And man, they was about ready to kill him. Number four, the interpersonal evangelist. You see in Matthew 15, Jesus dealing with the woman who told, now listen to what she told Jesus. She said, Jesus says, I'm not going to give you the children's bread, referring to the lost sheep of Israel. She said, even dogs eat the crumbs off the master's table. Even dogs. This woman was so lowly. She was so humble. She needed help for her daughter so bad. That she was willing to, she was willing to em, embrace the life of a dog just to get to Jesus Christ. Jesus says, woman, you have great faith. 
What made what made him an interpersonal evangelist in that moment? He was dealing one on one. This is, you know, dealing with your coworkers, the one on one interaction that you have. And when you read that in Matthew 15, he went from dealing with her one on one to preaching to multitudes of people. Interpersonal, able to deal with people on a personal level. Some people prefer to witness to people individually. That's perfectly fine. You need to know what you are, what type of person you are, and how God uses you most effectively. Because the truth is, the Titanic is sinking. The people are drowning. And God is calling you and me to go on a rescue mission. Number five, the invitation, the invitational evangelist. Man, come to church with me, man. Listen to this sermon. You're constantly inviting them. Hoping that when they come, they see the glory of God manifested. It talks about in 1 Corinthians how when people come into the gathering of the saints, when the spirit is moving and the gifts of the spirit are operating, the unbeliever can see the glory of God in the midst of the people and say, God is here. So a simple invitation of bringing somebody to the gathering of the saints, bringing somebody to the conference. Come on, man, I'll pay your way. Come and experience what it's like to be around real people of God. Come and meet with us on Sunday. You're always inviting them to different gatherings and different things going on. So people can see the interactions of Christians. These are the various ways of reaching people. The, the invitational evangelists. <clears throat> In Luke chapter 5, the scripture says, Then Levi held a banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. So Levi threw a party and he invited all of his buddies over. Jesus was there and he was praying, please let them see Jesus for who he is. Let the scales be removed from their eyes. He was an invitational evangelist. The last one is a service evangelist. A service, is, a service evangelist is like Tabitha or Dorcas in Acts chapter 9. Dorcas was always doing good and helping the poor. She was always serving somebody, giving food out, making cookies, and washing somebody's car, mowing somebody's lawn. Many ways to serve people, because you know what that does? That lowers the barrier that people usually have, and they're able to say, you know what, why are you doing this? What, what's the motivation behind you coming here to mow my grass, and you want to help me? What, why are you doing this? And you're able to lead people to Jesus Christ through being a service evangelist. Some people take a direct approach. They go straight at it like the confrontational evangelist. Some people are like Dorcas. They want to serve people. So many ways, man, to get people off of the ship that's sinking, to get people out of the world where the judgment of God is coming upon them. So recap, six different types of evangelists, confrontational, intellectual, testimonial, interpersonal, invitational, and a service evangelist. <clears throat> Where do you evangelize? Wherever there's fish. The harvest is plenty, the laborers are few. Pray ye to the Lord of harvest that you might be sent into the harvest. Whenever I go fishing, man, I'm running to get my pole into that water, especially if I know there's some fish in there. I'm trying to catch a fish. Wherever there are people, there's someone that needs to hear the truth. But you got to pray and seek God and be led by the Spirit. In the book of Acts, which is the very greatest book to read on evangelism. Read the whole book of Acts. Read it. Listen to it. Read it in different translations. You'll see evangelism on location. You'll see how they evangelize, what they said to people, the different people that they interacted with, where they went. There was a case in, in the book of Acts where... Paul was going to a city and the Bible says the spirit forbade him to go. The spirit said, no, don't go there. Go here. So when you step out to minister to people, if you're going out on the street for street evangelism, you trust God to lead the wheel of the car. He'll tell you where to go. I remember one time we went to a mall and we were going to go somewhere else. And the spirit led us to the mall. And it was a guy that had never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was the one person that God sent us there to preach the truth to. Um, an amazing experience. We read in Acts chapter 8 where the believers 
In Acts chapter 8, verse 4, they went everywhere preaching. And then you see Philip went to Samaria. He went to a specific place to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus preached everywhere. He preached on the boat. He preached in synagogues. He preached on the mountainside. Jesus didn't have any place that he wouldn't preach the gospel at. Jesus preached and evangelized everywhere he went. Every single place he went. That's who we're following. That's who we're preaching. That's who we're representing, Jesus Christ. We look to Jesus for the standard, for the model of what we do, becoming like Christ. In Matthew chapter 10, which is a really good chapter you want to study to learn more about this particular ministry, Jesus, he delegated authority to his disciples, and he told them, don't go to certain places. Go to these places. Go to these people. Don't go to people that don't welcome you and don't celebrate you. Don't go to them. Shake the dust off your feet if they don't see him. It'll be more tolerable than for Sodom and Gomorrah than for those cities that don't receive you. Why? Because if they receive you, they're receiving me. And if they receive me, they're receiving the one who sent me, which is God. Matthew chapter 10. Spend some time reading that. Different types of evangelism. Service. Relationship, they call it friendship evangelism. People on your job developing a friendship where people are comfortable to talk with you and y'all, you taking your coworker to lunch and you're able to share your life with them. Paul told one of the churches, he said, not only did we preach the gospel, but we shared our own souls with you. Our own lives were shared with you. Friendship evangelism. These are just various methods, various ways to reach people and to rescue them from perishing. To rescue them from becoming useless to God. The Bible says repent or perish. That word perish literally means something that has lost its original intended use. God created us for his glory. The glory is put out as I perish. You take a, a cell phone. I got my cell phone right here. This cell phone has a, a purpose for why it was made. If I don't use it that way, or if it's not used in the way that it was created to be used, it will perish. It will become useless. We're rescuing people from becoming useless to God. I always use the example of recycling cans. What good is a crushed can in a bag? What good is it? You take those cans to the recycling yard. Those cans have value in it once they've been recycled. Evangelism is the work the service of the ministry of reconciliation, bringing people back to God. The scripture says that God was in Christ reconciling the world back to himself. God wants to recycle people. He wants to rescue them from perishing. So it's different types of evangelism. You ever seen somebody walking around an apartment complex praying? People say, man, what are these folks doing out here praying? Tearing down the strongholds in that community. Waiting for people to respond and ask them questions. They're out going to evangelize. Proclamation evangelism. This is the folks that are out on the street. <clears throat> Everybody on the street, are not. they're not walking in the spirit. These folks that are going to these gay pride rallies and just condemning the people and then the people throw bottles at them and they feel like they got persecuted. They're not walking in the spirit. Because when God goes to save people, he will confront them. But it's a, it's a way that the Spirit moves to draw people. You going and calling the... What good would it have done Jesus if, if he looked at that adulterous woman and said, You whore, you were caught in the act of adultery. He looked at her and said, Neither do I condemn you. So he didn't bring any judgment upon her. She was already judged. The homosexual is already judged. The lesbian is already judged. The fornicator is already judged. You let the Spirit lead you for, for what to say to that person. But we're not here casting stones. We're not throwing a bunch of stones at people. It's true. We don't live in glass houses. I don't live in a glass house. So I ain't casting a bunch of stones on folks. Law to the proud, grace to the humble. The person that thinks that they can work their way into heaven, you're guilty under the law of God. You're not perfect. Jesus was perfect. He's the standard. He's the one that you need to be yoked to. Humble yourself and repent before the living God. That's why the Pharisees had such a hard time. 
because they thought they were doing some righteous thing. It says people would think that they're doing God a favor and kill the true prophets of God. They kill the Lord of glory, thinking that they were doing a good thing, not realizing he was the Messiah sent to save them. Relationship evangelism, proclamation evangelism. Jesus Christ was the greatest open air preacher that, that's ever lived, that ever existed on the planet, on this planet. The greatest open air preacher. When he fed the 5,000, how did all, all of them people heard him speak the truths of God? Jesus Christ was the greatest proclamation evangelist that ever existed. Door-to-door -door evangelism, giving somebody a track. A track ain't saving nobody. A track is nothing more than a conversation starter. It opens up the door for you to be able to talk to that person. A lot of times, I'll keep tracks in my pocket. And if I'm, if I'm standing somewhere waiting in line, I'll hand that track to somebody and I'll say, Hey, man, you ever got one of these? And they're looking like, what is this? No, I haven't gotten one. It's a gospel track. Do you know Jesus Christ? Have you heard the gospel? And it leads you right into sharing the gospel. It's not about the track. That, 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 doesn't, that doesn't really have no power in it. The power is in the preaching of the gospel, the demonstration of the kingdom. But it's a tool that you can use. Internet evangelism. The, the best example for internet evangelism is the Latter Days blog. Sister Mia Hunter has a blog. It's people that have come to the Omega conferences because they found her blog. We became a part of the ministry because my wife found the Latter Days blog. That work that Mia is doing is not in vain. She spent time writing those articles. People, if you go on the, if you go on that blog, the Latter Days blog spot, they have a ticker on the right side of that that blog that shows the different people that are viewing that site. You see people from the West Indies. You see people from all over this, from every continent. It's people that are viewing that blog. The internet is one of the greatest forms of preaching the truths of God. Thank God for what Mia is doing. Radio evangelism, phone evangelism, televangelist. Every televangelist preacher is not preaching false doctrine. Usually, the people that preach the truth are hard to find. You got to seek and search them out. But there are some people on the Word Network. There are some people. I don't know, I don't know too much about TBN. That whole, that whole setup might be corrupt. But there are people on some of these TV programs that have slots on television that are preaching the truth. But it has to be sought out. So we see these different forms of evangelism. How do you evangelize? How? There are some absolute essentials as I prepare to close to evangelizing. The first thing to do anything that I just said is to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Have you received the Spirit since you believed? Has God poured the Spirit and filled the vessel up in your life? Have you received the great compulsion? Now, Jesus gave the great commission in Matthew 28. But in order, to, in order to carry the great commission, you must have the great compulsion. The inward, the inward zeal that, that plunges you forward, that catapults you forward into the life of people. Absolutely essential. Don't be like the sons of Sceva and go out repeating what I said or repeating what somebody else said without having received the Holy Ghost. Seek the Holy Ghost. Pray for God to, re to give you the Holy Ghost. If you believed on Christ and you're taking strides to follow after Jesus Christ, you need to receive the promise. That promise is for you. Read the book of Acts. Look at how in Acts chapter 2, the, when the Spirit fell, man, it broke out. It broke out. The gospel, the kingdom of God was being manifested on earth to bring people into the truth. Beware of trying to be like the sons of Sceva and repeating what Paul said. Repeating what people say. That won't have an effect on people. You need the Holy Ghost governing your words. Receive the Holy Ghost of God. Pray through to get the Spirit of God. Stop talking to people. Stop trying to argue and debate with people until you've received the great compulsion. You cannot do the Great Commission until you've received the Great Compulsion. 
the inward zeal of God. Jesus said, zeal for the Father's house consumes me. He was full of the Holy Ghost. He was full of power, able to demonstrate the kingdom of God. That's where fear comes. People know I don't really have the spirit. So I'm not going to step out here because I don't want to get embarrassed. I don't want to get hurt. You step out full of the spirit and watch what happens. Those devils will go running. Paul we know. Jesus we know. Who are you, man? What are you doing here? You don't have the inward witness. You don't have the great compulsion operating in you to deal with us. Because there's demons in the street. You got to be full of love. You got to be full of the fear of God. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus warned them, do not fear. Don't fear man that can kill the body, but he can't kill the soul. The fear of God governs a person. The love of God is absolutely essential to ministering to people. Because you know how boneheaded you were. You know how knuckleheaded I was. You got to love people to the truth. You got to be patient with folks. You got to lead folks. And these are absolutely essential. The Bible says in 1 John 4, perfect love cast out all fear. There is no fear of stepping out on the street. Because I don't fear these people that I'm going to talk to. I love them. And because I love them, I'm not afraid of them. Because they can't destroy my body. They can't destroy my soul. They can only kill the body. I fear God. Therefore, I tell them the truth. You need to receive the Holy Ghost of God. Pray through. Acts chapter 19, the disciples said, we haven't even heard of the Holy Ghost. Receive the Holy Ghost of God. The threefold witness that's necessary, and I close with this. You must preach the gospel. You must practice the gospel. And you must have power to demonstrate the gospel. It's what you say. It's what you preach. It's your message. It's what you practice. It's how you live. It's your lifestyle. And it's the power. It's what you do. It's the demonstration of the kingdom. That's the threefold witness. In one, in one Thessalonians one, Paul had he he named all three of those that had brought the Thessalonian church to a healthy, sound faith. And he said, "People have heard about your faith. We haven't even had to say anything. They've heard about y'all being strong believers because the kingdom was demonstrated. They were practicing what they were preaching." The threefold witness is absolutely necessary to walk in this. If you're missing the power, if you're lacking in the lifestyle, get it straight before you try to minister and represent the kingdom of God because you want to be effective. You want to be faithful. You want to lead people the right way. And if you haven't received the Holy Ghost, right there where you sit, I'll pray for God to pour out his spirit in your life. In the name of Jesus, God, we come before you now. You said if we ask, if we seek, if we knock, you would open the door. And I'm praying for those that have been seeking the power of the Holy Ghost. That right where they stand, Lord God, you pour out the Holy Ghost. You fill them up, Lord. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, God. The Bible says, the, as, the, as the Spirit gave them, they spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance. Open up your mouth and receive the Holy Ghost of God. In Jesus' name, we pray for him right now, God, to receive the Holy Ghost, Lord. Let it be with evidence. Let the spiritual speech come from their belly, Lord. Out of their belly shall flow rivers of living water. In Jesus' name, we pray for him right now. We pray for those, Lord God, that have received the Holy Ghost. We pray you refill them with the Holy Ghost and send them into the harvest, O God. Make them a witness, O Lord. Take, Give them the strategies and the tools and the tips to reach people, O God. Having received the Spirit, Lord God, go forth in the name of Jesus. Those that have already received the great compulsion, seek God till you're refilled all over again. In Jesus' name. And God, we pray for those that have yet to be born again. If you haven't been born again, the Bible says repentance and believing the gospel is your way in. Repent. Turn from what you are. Throw away the porno. Get rid of the filth and the garbage. And Jesus Christ will draw near to you. Repentance is not something that you say. Repentance is something that you do. Bring forth fruits to show that you have repented. Other than that, don't even waste your time. You have to change in order to walk in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for them right now to be born again. God offers you eternal life if you'll repent. If you'll throw yourself on the mercy of God. And confess your sins before Almighty God and turn from what you are. 
Jesus Christ offers you eternal life. That is the good news. This is Evangelism 101. This is just the fundamentals of evangelism and reaching people. It goes deeper. There's more to it. This is just the first session, the first teaching that we're having in order to gain a better understanding and more equipment to deal with people. We got to be equipped to do the work of the ministry. So hopefully we can have a 201. We'll talk more about discipleship and what happens after you gather the people in, raising them up as children of God. We want to get into that because we want to see people reproducing after their own kind. That's what we're after, seeing people really raised up in the ministry and able to be effective for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, tonight. Amen. Announcements to close. Conference, May 22nd through the 25th, 2015. The information should be coming towards the end of the year. Start putting a little money back now because, hey, we want to see you there. Those that are ready to go forward and really be about the Father's business, start inviting people. Start telling people. Burn up the CDs. Get the word out. The word will do the work. But you got to do, you have to be the hands that God will use. Uh, prayer line starting up here. I'm a little uh, behind on time. The prayer line, I'm sure folks are getting ready to call in. That number is 805-399-1000. 805-399-1000. The access code is 409-367. The access code is 409-367. Call in the prayer line as we're going to be praying and seeking the face of God. As we see the end time approaching, it's a good opportunity to fellowship and pray through to a breakthrough. And lastly, support Dunamis Tabernacle. This ministry is for real. We're looking to see base camps raised up so we can be those, we can be that lifeboat to help rescue the perishing and see them through to wholeness in Jesus Christ. God wants to see people whole, spirit, soul, and body. And we need a place to do that. Support the Dunamis Tabernacle. Come back to the live stream on Sunday. There's another broadcast. And continue to support. Keep praying, keep believing, and keep standing. In Jesus' name, thanks for listening in tonight. God bless.